make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> So they're hightailing it. Like by the 25th, the night of the 25th, within 24 hours, they're out of there. And so they 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 leave, and they are they are literally going down the southern route out of Kiev because the Russians are coming in from the north, right? And out of Belarus, and they know, okay, we got to kind of skirt around here, but they can see the glow of artillery fire. They can hear it. And they're telling the kids it's fireworks. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but the war is this, this close. And so they got this precious cargo, right? And so the first thing that happens, they're in the middle of nowhere. And, and Ukraine, it's a gorgeous country. I mean, most of it's just like sunflowers in the summertime and just a lot of agriculture. And the soil's super rich. And they're suddenly, but it's this is, of course, March. So there's it's just, you know, it's like Minnesota or whatever. And they, one of the buses breaks down. Hello, faithful politics watchers. If you're watching us and joining us on YouTube or listening, if you're joining us via the podcast on any of our various platforms that we post the pot podcast to, this is Josh Bertram. I'm your faithful host. And uh, we have, as always with us, our ever faithful and political political host, Will. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for asking. Good, good. And today I'm really excited. We get to talk to a veteran author. Well, he's not a veteran like a, a United States veteran. I said that wrong. But Kyle Duncan is a 35-year publishing veteran. Hey, do you, do they hand out medals for publishing veterans? Is that Pulitzer no. Prize? That must be Pulitzer Prize. No, well, my dad my dad <laughs> served on a battleship during World War II. So he's he was the real veteran in the family. Well, there you go, man. Well, hey, yeah. you have veteran blood in yeah. you. For sure. And Kyle has been a New York Times bestselling uh, writer and ghostwriter. He's worked with scores of bestselling authors, including John Wooden, uh, Wooden rather, Dr. Gary Chapman, Voice of the Martyrs, and Toby Mack. Duncan has a English literature degree from UCLA and writes full time from his home in San Diego, California. And he and his wife Suzanne have three biological daughters and an adopted son, Corey, Janya, who is from Mariupol. Ukraine. Did I say that right? You did. Very good. Mariop Mariopol. Well, Mariupol. Kyle, thanks yeah. so much, Mariupol. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we're going to be talking about your book, Hope for Ukraine, that you've written and has come out this year for Baker Publishing. So talk to me just a little bit. How did you get into writing about Ukraine? And how did this idea of writing a book about Ukraine surface and, and, and come before you? Sure. First of all, um, Josh and Will, I want to thank you very much for having me. We've tried to do this a couple of times. I had a little bit of sickness. I had my COVID 2.0 <laughs> a few weeks ago, and uh, but it's really a pleasure to be with you guys. And I just want to say, give a plug to this podcast. I think it's wonderful, especially the coverage you've been doing lately with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which obviously affects us all, um, whether we're believers or not. It's It's obviously a very intense international situation. Yeah, that's a great question. How did I end up writing a book about Ukraine? Um, the easy answer is that the Holy Spirit opened a lot of doors for me. And nice. I just, I, you know, they, they swung open and I, I walked through them. But um, yeah, so so that story, which which is, is part of the book, uh, I tell it in the book in a chapter called Eugenia. But really, you have to go back all the way to 01. Uh, my wife and I at the time had two biological daughters, little ones. They're in their 20s now. But at that time, they were little, and um, we, be, uh, my wife Suzanne, became pregnant with our third uh, little boy that we named Joseph. But in the womb, we found out that he had very severe um, genetic defects and a condition called trisomy 13. And we were in Santa Barbara at Cottage Hospital, and the doctors were sympathetic, but they said, you know, you just need to terminate the pregnancy because this, this kid isn't going to live outside the womb. 
And before I could open my big fat mouth and say something fairly snarky back, um, my wife said, you know, um, is my life in danger carrying this, this child? And they said, no. And she said, well, you know, God gives life, God takes away, and we're going to see this um, pregnancy determination. They thought we were crazy. Um, but our son uh, miraculously actually was born and lived for three days, which oh, defied wow. all. He had all sorts of internal complications. Um, and that was, and then he died. Um, we were supposed to have the service uh, at about 10, 10 a.m. on on September 11th of 2001. And two wow. days before, um, our doctor friend, we were going to do it in his backyard. He said, I got a surgery suddenly. Can we move the service to Thursday? So my son did, died on Labor Day. Um, we were supposed to have the service on 9-11. It got moved to 9-13. So some of my relatives back east couldn't even make it because, of course, planes were grounded. Mm. It was quite a week. My best friend from high school died in Tower 2. So it was it was intense, oh as gosh. you guys can imagine. You know, you, no one ever... The adage is you don't you never want to adult should never have to bury a child, um, a parent. And uh, absolutely, we got we got through that. You know, um, two of the NICU nurses came to Christ at the service at the memorial. Um, wow! So Joseph's legacy lives on. Be be you know um, um, to this day. So anyway, um, a couple of years later, we had a third child, um, a girl named Zoe. Which you might you guys are, have passed through background. Know your Hebrew, which means um, spirit, spirit or life in Hebrew. And she was kind of our bonus baby. And I thought I'm all done with mm. it. I'm great. <laughs> I'm a dad. I got three daughters. And then my wife, um, when Zoe was a little one, uh, we were living in Minnesota at the time. I was working for a publishing house, Baker Publishing Group, by the way, the the ones that ended up publishing my book. So there's a shout out to everybody at Baker. Okay. And at the time, I was VP publisher of nonfiction for one of their imprints called Bethany House. But anyway, we were in Minnesota. We had our three girls. Youngest is an infant, Zoe. And one of my one night my wife is just sitting there and she's not the kind of person who would just walk in this room right now and say, the Lord's telling me this, this, this. It does happen and she does, you know, hear from God. But it was that small still voice saying, um, I want you to adopt. And she was like, whoa, this is way out of left field. So the second night, we're back, you know, doing the nightly routine, right? So it's the next night. Same thing. She's like, well, Lord, I've been praying for unwanted children around the world, but are you sure this is what you want us to do? And and then the third night, God was very specific. And he said, I want you to adopt, but I want, not a baby, but a little boy. And I want you to adopt from Ukraine. It was that specific. And my wife, I'm wow. more of the geography nerd. And um, I do like, I go to TripAdvisor and do those geography quizzes to see if I can figure out where Tunisia Tunisia is. But um, she she's like, I that's a former USSR Republic. But she went to the, the little girl's old school, you know, those blue globes, you spin it and she had to look it up on the map. She goes, okay, there's Ukraine. Well, interestingly enough, she didn't tell me about this. She she treasured it in her heart for about six months, told some of her friends who were real prayer warriors to just be praying for her. And then she pops this on me uh, on our anniversary and we we're out to eat because she's like, OK, we're in a public place and he's going to be in happy a happy anniversary. Mood. Yeah. And she goes, the Lord spoke to me recently and said we need to adopt a little boy from you. And I'm like, no way. I have three girls. And then she said, not a baby. And I'm like, you know, I didn't just fall at the turnip truck yesterday. I mean, mm. you get into the issues of, you know, kids who are, God bless them, but kids who are in orphanage in, in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, I mean, they're not coming from, you know, healthy, usually healthy, functional family situations. And she said, well, that's what the Lord told me. And so anyway, fast forward, I, the, the Lord finally grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and, uh, <laughs> I wrestled with him. I did a little Jacob moment. And finally, um, you know, I said, okay, Lord, you know, I read the verse in James, take care of the widows and orphans. And we've all read that a ton of times, but suddenly yeah. it was, it was a mandate and I could either silently obey or disobey. And we all have those moments every day. I have, you know, we have them and no one else would know, you know, and I could have glossed it over with my 
you know, uh, Christianese. I've been in this sub- subculture, you know, a long time. <laughs> you know the right word. Absolutely. So anyway, uh, that was in 07. So we uh, ended up flying to Ukraine, and that was about two years of prep, FBI background checks. I mean, it's 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 like you know oh, uh, going through ESCO on a home times ten the paperwork. It's inc- incredibly crazy. But we went and we we met this little guy, and um, in Mariupol, we flew into Kiev, beautiful city by the way, just gorgeous, and um, and then we we. We travel down to Mariupol, which is like four or five hundred miles, and um, beautiful city, port town, right near right near the Azov Sea, little you know part of the Black Sea area. And we ended up adopting this little guy, and uh, his name was Zhenya. And so uh, we thought, ah, eh, Americans can have a little tough time pronouncing that name, so we named him Corey after my great grandfather, and we kept Zhenya as his middle name. And he is now uh, twenty two years old. So, so that's a, a bit more than you guys probably needed, but it sets the stage for why I was. In I that appreciate position, it, you know. And then in fourteen, of course, um, Russia uh, annexed Crimea. There was the Maidan revolution that we we all mm. were aware of happening in Kiev. There was there was a fairly bloodless. Uh, I mean, it wasn't completely, but um, a fairly bloodless transition of power to more democratic regime. Um, and then the more, more hard, hard right, more Soviet type, um, uh, Yanukovych was ousted and had to, had to go to Belarus. But anyway, so we've been really following closely what's happening over there, especially as Corey got older. And he's like, what's happening today, dad, in the Civil War? So, you know, most Americans were aware there was something happening in the Donbass region, that southeastern part of Ukraine. But we were following it pretty closely. So. You know, having a son from Ukraine, it just kind of instilled that um, perspective in us to, to, and especially myself, I have a journalism background, writing, editing, and I just kind of kept on top of things. Um, so fast forward then again to February 24th of 2022, um, despite claims, you know, from the Kremlin that they were not going to invade Ukraine, they did. We kind of all knew that they would. I mean, you don't just position like 250,000 troops <laughs> on your neighbor's border just, just to because do it. you just just to sing kumbaya so um the invasion happened and um uh went to church that sunday uh life church here and uh my pastor uh benji horning uh he's like i'm shelving my pat on my ser- sermon today and we're going to just pray for ukraine and pray for wow. peace and pray for wow. um a limitation of violence there and i went home that night and I was just really, um, really, I had like a, uh, an indignation, like a, a, just a rage because we'd gotten to know people in Ukraine. I knew, mm. I knew a lot of people within the evangelical movement there, which is pretty large. Um, and we had, you know, facilitators and, and people that we knew through the adoption agency that we kept in, I, I made an effort to keep in touch with. So it was very intense and I'm on telegram or WhatsApp, you know, um, back and forth with friends in Kiev, and they said it's really dire, Kyle. I mean, we're not going to be able to stop Russia. They're the number two military in the world. We don't know what's going to happen. We have to flee. And um, so that night, the Lord just dropped this. I was just praying. I'm like, Lord, I feel so helpless. You know, I know I can give and give money, and that's that. As a side note, that's the most powerful thing we can do: give money to the organizations we trust that that can help. But, um. He dropped this idea. I, and as you mentioned, I work with Toby Mack on a couple of books and DC Talk and Michael Tate, great guys. And um, if you recall, they did the book Jesus Freaks, which is a story, it's a do, collection yes. of those, you know, martyrs. And then I do, did a book with them called Under God, which was more of sort of the faith foundation and looking at the roots of America. But it wasn't just it wasn't just a whitewash. I mean, we looked at the atrocities, the Native American situation, the African American situation, looking at Sojourner Truth and um, and just a lot of the gritty details, you know. And and I thought that's a great way to tell a story. And what the Lord did is dropped in my spirit. I want you to write a book of stories, but I want you to get out of the way. And and don't just inject your opinions and everything. Just capture stories of Ukrainians on the ground. So that kind of kicked off um, 
a process with uh, a colleague of mine named Esther Federkevich, and you could probably tell by her name, she's from that part of the world. And she, indeed, her roots in Ukraine go back on both sides, like three generations. So I talked to Esther, who's um, a prominent uh, literary agent in our industry, and together we decided to do this. And within like three days, we had a book deal, which is unheard of. Um, and within about two wow. weeks, I was on a plane. And so in late March of 2022, the, on about the one month anniversary of the invasion, I was landing in Krakow, Poland, and um, I made some contacts, whatnot, with like Convoy of Hope and Samaritan's Purse and uh, some other organizations on the ground there, um, relief and humanitarian organizations. And then God just threw up, opened these incredible door doors for me, uh, Will and Josh, that I couldn't have opened on my own. And within about a three-week period, I interviewed um, soldiers, refugees, Polish aid workers, aid workers at the border from Israel, Egypt. I mean, it was the Red Crescent, the Red Cross. Um, I can't remember the name from Israel, but it was like, it was a, it was such an overwhelming, beautiful experience, which sounds weird because these refugees are in a horrific, hellish situation coming over the border. But, yeah. but, but the humanitarian side was complete, just completely undid me because you had all the religions of the world there. Uh, working together, um, and you, I was meeting vanfuls of people from Portugal that had driven three days, Germany, the UK, you know, like through the channel and then across Europe, and just wanting to do something. And at the time, uh, the flow, as you guys will recall, at one the height of it, fourteen million Ukrainians came across the border, which is like. There's Holy only 45 smokes. million people in the country. So now, since then, about 10 million have gone back. There's about three or four million still remaining in Europe. But it was so that's kind of the 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 arc of how I ended up in Poland and how I ended up crossing into Western Ukraine and doing some interviews there as well. And uh, kind of much to my wife's chagrin, but I explained there's no bombing going on where I'm going, and and then this. I came back. I wrote the book in like five weeks, weeks, which was insane. Um, That's but crazy. There you go. And it was overall a, just a, li a, a life changing experience. I think that's so cool. Um, and I love just hearing your heart and kind of like how God has sort of, you know, used maybe first your wife and then <laughs> by osmosis, you know, use you both and then you. Um, so I just think that that's pretty phenomenal. And it, that's just kind of, that's what our God does, you know, like, yeah. and, and I think it's, it's phenomenal, but I, you know, being that you have been to Ukraine, you've seen, you know, the devastation, but you've also seen just the humanity of, of some folks. Um, and th this is going to be a, a little bit of a political question, but not, but not okay. totally. Um, you know, cause that, that's, that's sort of my shtick. Like I'm the political guy. Right. And Josh is the, is the radical yeah. conservative, how much the U S should be involved with what's going on in Ukraine. And I, I'd love to just kind of get your, your thoughts about like, what, what is the proper level of involvement, um, for the right. United States government to be involved with Ukraine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, I, so first of all, just to, just to, um, clarify i am not a war journalist mm. i'm not a, a political reporter i'm a dad i am a writer and i do have a journalism background mostly in the christian you know the faith-based space but i will say that um so i'm coming at it will um from that position you know um with my experience in working with hundreds of authors and so mostly from a spiritual perspective um so I would I would begin by saying my dad always my dad was a believer. Um, I was fortunate to have a, a great role model in my father, and he always taught me to pray the news. And so what I try to do is pray all the news. Like I'm usually on YouTube for a lot of my news. Um, Al Jazeera, from Al Jazeera to Fox to MSNBC to Reuters, BBC, New York Times. I try to read broadly, and I use sorry to plug another. I use an app called Ground. Mm -hmm. uh, which which kind of does an algorithm that tells you if the stories are left, right, center. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you guys great. are probably very familiar with it. I'm sure. Look who I'm talking to. <laughs> um, but none of us are none of us are unbiased in our opinions. No journalist right. who you go on the best journal, you know, whether you listen to NPR or Fox, no journalist is unbiased. They will say they are, but it's just not possible. Um, so coming at it, a lot, a lot of disclaimers there. I would say that um, I want to. I want to. I'm going to answer your question, but I want to read a paragraph, uh, if you don't mind, from the book. Um, this is not shameless plugging, guys. It's because I, I feel like please do. I had a sense we'd talk about this, and I met a gentleman. Um, one of the most fascinating interviews I had there. He uh, was a gentleman named named uh, Valentin Karenovich. He's probably in his mid to late 60s now. Um, he's a pastor now in Kiev, and he's a professor at uh, European Theological Seminary. You may notice the name of the town, Irpine, where a lot of the atrocities took place at the beginning of the war. Um, a lot of the, the Hague um, uh, war crimes have been logged and are being processed there by what happened there. Terrible um, murder of innocent people. Anyway, uh, Colonel Karinovich, before he became a pastor or a Christian, was in the Red Army. So he was an officer. He was a colonel in the Soviet Army. And when the wall fell, uh, wow. he's like to his wife, he's like, what do you want to do now? You know, should we stay in the <laughs> army? I mean, he was he was a a card carrying member of the Communist Party, atheist to the core, followed the party line. So he and his wife decided to go and kind of regroup and move back to Ukraine, where his parents lived. And he was there. He became a Christian there. And um, then he's like, he met some Americans and, and leaders in the church here and in chaplaincy programs. And one of them challenged him and said, you need to start um, a, a born again or an evangelical chaplaincy program in Ukraine. And he goes, I didn't think Christians were allowed in the military. <laughs> that wasn't his experience. Right. And he's a brand new believer, but he's brilliant. Right. And so fast forward, that's what he ended up doing. Plus he became a colonel in the Ukrainian army. So, when I talk to Colonel Karinovich, I joke with him and I say, you you were probably among a handful of born again people in the world that served both as an officer in the Soviet Red Army up until 89 and in the, the Ukrainian yeah, I can't even... army after the it's pretty. He's like just a purple cow. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading to you his how he might answer your question mm. partially, and then I'll answer the rest of it. He says, toward the end of his chapter, I think God wants to achieve several goals through this war. The first is to motivate his people to pray and to prepare for the second coming of Christ. I get a little bit emotional when I read that. We live in a time when the Antichrist will come from one side and God is preparing us for this. But from the other side, God prepares something opposite. God's other goal in this war is to destroy the Antichrist spirit in Moscow and even in Ukraine, where many people still have a Soviet world mentality. So at its crux, I would agree with Colonel Karinovich that on a spiritual level, and I'm not demonizing Russia. I know a lot of believers there. You guys probably do, too. Um, but there is a, there's an animating spirit, I think, that is in some, not all, the politicians there, that is just born out of a very atheistic, um, non-deistic, theistic approach to worldview and thought. And I think that's part of the reason that I think that that had a lot to do with the illegal invasion. I do call it blatantly illegal, an illegal invasion into a peaceful neighboring country. How much we should be giving? Um, I, I think I think it's better to send a very minute portion of our overall military budget than it is to put soldiers on the ground. And I think it's that serious. I think that Putin, if left to his devices, would not stop in Ukraine. I believe it would spill into Moldova. Um, you've seen lately what uh, the Hungarian Orban and the Slovakian Prime Minister Fico, who was just elected on October 4th, have said they're kind of aligning um, with President Putin. Jeez. Um, and so I I try to pray the news every morning. 
Um, but I also, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that like everybody, I can easily fall into binary fallacy, which says that, you know, Russia's evil and, and we're, you know, the great United States. And we, you know, we've, we've, con- you know, our soldiers have committed atrocities as well through the years. Unfortunately, there's bad apples in every military, but, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. I think it's better to spend send as much material. I think we're not sending enough, frankly. I think this sort of trickle method um, is just um, is unfortunate, you know, um, and that the the longer range missiles in the F-16 should have been there a year ago. That's my personal opinion. Oh. I agree. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's that that's super cool to hear that and to hear from someone who has – a lot of, um, you have skin in the game, right? Your son is from Ukraine. So you, when you're, I, I didn't even know Mariupol was a place until I saw that it was attacked, right? That it was a city. I had no idea. Yeah. Probably, um, I, I assume I'm like a lot of Americans. I mean, I'm sure a bunch knew what that was, but probably my guess is many, many, many were like me having no idea and not really thinking about right. Ukraine ever. You know, until the Ukraine yeah. war, war started. Yeah, I mean, why would yeah. you? It's like, I mean, you know, the 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 civil war in Yemen. It's it's. I try to follow it, but I don't have a lot of skin in yeah, that game. It's so. like you're not you're not emotionally compelled to follow right. it necessarily. But when you're going through these different narratives, what did you find out about the intersection of faith and the instinct to survive <laughs> amidst the adversities? adversities of war how do those two things right. come together this beauty of faith and then this raw just instinct to survive which means to kill and and, and different like things like that depending on the situation right. so how did you how, how did you experience that what, what do you have, have any insight on sure. that? sure sure and 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 before i answer I, I just want to agree with you on that um you know josh that i I, I am emotional about it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not unbiased, you know, I, I've been trying to, I've, for a while now, I've been, there's my dog. Sorry. I got <laughs> No worries. Close We've had me. dogs before. My, yeah, I'm sure you have. Uh, so <laughs> he, he likes to chime in. Uh, so I have um, a son who's 22. He wants to go kick butt. And it's everything I can do to keep him from jumping on a plane, mm. flying into Poland, taking the train to you know Przemysl which yeah. is the largest border crossing and getting his tail over to Lviv and joining the international legion that's what he wants to do he wants to go kick some butt mm. and um he was in young marines here at camp pendleton and and has you know prayed and thought about marine corps i would be very proud of him to do that but mm. i just i'd rather he not go fight for the legion he's studying to be a welder i said let's wait till the war's over and i will go with you and if you want to live there because he's learning the language and you want to weld and help rebuild, that's my, that's my deal with you. So, mm. and I, so I kind of bribed him with that. But anyway, um, when that I saw sense. there, when I was there, when I was there, right, which was right at the beginning, um, interviewing a lot of people on the front line and the, the specter of death was something I'd never seen. You know, I didn't serve in the military um, I, I'm not a, a frontline servant in, in, you know, fire or police or, or in the medical field. I didn't, I, I haven't been exposed to that. And to talk and look someone in the eye whose husband was killed, you know, in Kharkiv. Um, and then to talk to the wife and the two little girls um, at the border They've just been, they've just spent 30 months, you know, underground living off of pond water that's boiled, living off of beans, you know, looking like, you know, super thin and, and just hollowed out and, um, you know, sitting there at the border and waiting in line with them to cross back over, which is what I did. I, I walked over and then I wanted to walk back and it was like a nine to 10 hour experience that changed my life. But, um, and one one stark kind of word picture um, about that that intersection, um, actually, two people personify um, w- what you're asking me. One was a gentleman um, when I was standing in line 
So everyone I was just standing in line with had just come off a bus at the border from Kharkiv. And at the time, um, Kharkiv was still in Russian hands. It's since been liberated um, by the Ukrainians about a year ago. Ukraine took Kharkiv back. It's right on the border. And it's just been pummeled, you know. But um, so here I am in line. I'm standing in line, right? And with all these people from Kharkiv, and some of the younger people are speaking English, and they're just telling me stories that I'm just like, um, I don't know whether to cry for joy that they made it out or, or laugh or cry or whatever. But um, so I'm there and um, I meet this, this man in front of me who he's with his family. And I said, um, what are your plans when you get to Poland? And he said, well, I'm going to get my family back set, set up and I'm going back in. And I said, but you're, he, aren't you over fighting age? You know, over 60, you don't, the men don't have to stay. They can leave. And he goes, yeah, but um, I have to go back. It's my home. He said, they can destroy every house there, but it is my home and we will fight for it. God willing, we'll be able to save it. And, and then another story. And, and I, so I, I spoke to a couple other people there who were, who were believers um, and uh probably Ukrainian Orthodox and, but we were talking about Jesus and, and they said that um, they'd seen evil that they couldn't have imagined, but they believed that, um, that they would emerge and that, uh, that God had not abandoned them, which is pretty incredible because they been that had been tested to the, uh, they had gone through things worse than Job, you know, and, but, um, the other part of this that, that I think answers your question is um, once you cross over from through the Ukrainian customs, there's a there's a gray zone of about a quarter mile that you walk through. It's really surreal. And then you get to the Polish border crossing. Well, at the Ukrainian one, there was no um, metal detector. But to get into Poland, there is. So a lot of people will tr- dump whatever you know metal stuff they have that they can't take over. and I met an aid worker there as I was standing in line to get through the Polish customs. And it was kind of outside. It was dark. It was 11 p.m. at night. And he, he said, do you see that? Do you see that um, pile, that, that knife over there? And I looked over. There was a steak knife that, peop- that, uh, that somebody had obviously, like, poked through the fence, you know, like the fencing. And it was just laying on the ground. He said, every week we have to go over and clean up um, huge piles of knives there. I said, what? Why? He said the Ukrainian women, (laughs) when they flee their homes, they've heard the stories of the Russian soldiers stopping the trains and raping the women, and it's the only protection they have. And once they reach the border crossing, they realize they're going to be safe, and so they can ditch their knives. And he said every week we have to clean up hundreds of knives from Ukrainian women trying to protect themselves. And then once you got to the other side um, the following day, I went and I was interviewing some folks from Israel, uh, from one of their prominent aid organizations. And they said, I said, what do you need the most? And they said, uh, rape kits. He said, we've run out of rape kits. And he said, um, most of the Ukrainian, a lot of the, the Ukrainian women want them for their children. So that, that, that's something obviously that embeds in you, um, that haunts me. And again, I'm not trying to demonize all Russian soldiers, but there's there's been enough of that. It's evil. It's 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 reprehensible. Yeah. And um, but that hopefully answers your question yeah. about that intersection. It just I saw the extremes of both. Yes, the beauty of faith, um, which the horror of yeah. survival, fighting for survival, right. having to fight. Yeah, and then these gritty stories yeah. that you're obviously right trying to make sure people understand the reality, right? We just had a right. podcast with uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Hassan or Hassan. And he said, uh, he, he's an expert on cults and he's an expert on how people um, uh, get, get someone like to believe misinformation. Right. Oh, go ahead. What, what were you saying? Oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. So anyway, we just had this, um, interview with him and he talks about how uh how how important it is that we're actually 
um, trying to trying to see reality for what it is. He calls it a reality check that like cult yeah. cult leaders, right, or people in cults. He walks them through if they're trying to, you know, deprogram and reprogram. He has to walk them through. Okay, how do we do a reality check? And I think that this book right. could be a reality check for a lot of Christians as to see, hey, here's what's really happening. Here's what's going on in all of right. this. And in that grittiness, how do you think your experience has either challenged or reinforced your understanding of the human cost of war? Right. I, I It was humbling to be able to I wasn't on the front line, obviously, but I was talking to people who had been or who were like, like Colonel Karenovich. So he now heads up the largest chaplaincy program in Ukraine. So they're called war chaplains. And he says, I have, I am in touch with hundreds of chaplains across the whole 1000 mile or 1000 kilometer front line. Um, it's, it's, you know, beyond the pale. I mean, anybody who's been in trench warfare, you know, I mean, I just rewatched Gettysburg the other night, the movie, and I'm looking at these guys 170 years ago fighting in trenches. And then you go watch the video clips of the war in Ukraine and like, it ain't much different. Obviously the weaponry is very advanced, but these guys are like firing at each other from like 30 feet away or it's like saving private Ryan. It's, it's, but it's not a movie, you know? And the reality is it's beyond what I can understand, you know, but, um, I feel like God was able to open a window for me to at least capture, you know, a little capsule of stories, right. That were captured from a very, you know, limited number of people. There's like 25 stories in a limited amount of time in a limited specific period in history. But, um, for me, it, it did reinforce how, um, deplorable uh, war is, which sounds almost cliche and hollow, but just watching, you know, obviously we all watch what happened originally, you know, and the Hamas came over at the festival and then through the kibbutzes and in the, in those, in the area right on the border in Gaza Strip. And then we've seen little children in, in Palestinian, in, in the hospitals in Gaza and it, it rips you apart. And that, and that's with our biblical, picture of you know the jews is god cho god's chosen people and it's like man what it's the old <laughs> and i don't mean to delve into that but i'm saying it's a conundrum of the human spirit and i i would be lying to you if i told you i could wrap my arms all the way around it i i'm just trying to i'm just wake up today and like lord you know like charles colson used to say how now shall i live today how do you want me to pray what can i do from my little corner of the earth here in San Diego, you know, for the people you've placed in my life. Um, but I don't presume to have the answers to, you know, to, to everything. I will, I will say one other thing. I, I do have a lot of friends who are, I call myself a pretty moderate um, evangelical in terms of, you know, I do believe in climate change and things. Some of your listeners are going to throw tomatoes right. at me. They've already thrown but, it at me. Um, but I'm also very, I'm very pro-life, you know, I'm a staunch pro-life guy. But here's the thing. Um, I have been kind of just gobsmacked by, by the, what I see as, as um, fake news about uh, how horrific the Ukrainian government is and um, that Putin is, ah, is he really that's such a bad guy? There's almost this sort of quiet um, winking and nodding of, um, acceptance in a way of, of, well, you know, Ukraine is, is in bed with the Bidens and there's a bunch of secret bio labs over there. And, and I'm like, you know, guys, all I have is my experience. And I have a lot of God loving, Jesus loving people there on the ground. When I share that with them, they just, they go, that is, that is the most ridiculous have them come and, and see what they've done to, to our wives and our, and our, and our children and indiscriminately bombing cities just to take out the power grid so that there's no heat in the winter. Mark my words in the next couple of months, it starts getting colder. They're going to be Russians will start hitting the power grids again. Um, that's not a military action. That's to terrorize the civilians. So 
obviously I'm tipping my hand a bit here um, as to my proclivities and where I stand, but <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's inter- like, I, I, I hear all the same, um, all the same comments about Ukraine and even about, you know, what's happening with Israel and Palestine. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of my own, I don't know, um, exercises or things that I have to try to keep myself from doing is just try not to look at it as so black and white Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, let's say, you know, everything that they're saying about Biden and Ukraine is true. Well, that doesn't negate the suffering. Exactly. (laughs) Like like people are still, you know, getting getting raped and tortured and killed. It's like, right. It's like, uh, that's important too, you know, like maybe more so than what Hunter Biden's up to, um, and right. anything. Um, yeah. so, but, but, you know, I, I want to ask you though, about, um, about like miraculous or even like sure. divine interventions that, that, um, you may have seen or maybe can't, can't be explained by, you know, anything else than like, like God yeah. was in this. And, and, you know, I, 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 I know that we've got listeners, watchers of the show that come from all different faith um, backgrounds sure. or no faiths. And, you know, and I, I, I say often on the show, like I, I didn't grow up Christian. Like I, I came to, I came to faith in 2008 when I married my wife, who was a PK. Um, <laughs> and um, she, or, you know, another way to look at, at this is she, she recruited me into the cult of one. Um, and I, <laughs> she definitely I has undue left. influence on you. Well, <laughs> she had yeah. undue influence on, on me, but yeah, but, that sounds but like, that sounds awesome though. She sounds know, like, like, like a dynamo. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, 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 uh, I don't think your father listens to this podcast, but let's just say that I might've overemphasized how Christian I was when I wasn't at the time that I was courting her. Um, so, um, Larry, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I love it. <laughs> but, but like, yeah. but, but like, I, I, I do, I do believe in miracles. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm a believer and, um, right. I've, I've mentioned before that, like, so I was in the service. I was injured. My left knee was like, I don't know, twisted all kinds. It was messed mm. up. And I used to wear a knee brace on it. And I was on this, this uh, mission trip where this pastor had asked if he could pray for it. And I'm just like, whatever, dude. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, like, and he prayed for it. And like, I didn't have to wear the knee brace anymore. Like, it, it was immediate. And I I'm love just it. Like, I was like, I don't, I don't know how that works. <laughs> he wrecked your theology. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, so I, I love, I love to hear stories um, yeah. uh, of stuff maybe you've seen or experienced when you're over yeah. there. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, cause a lot of what I've been talking about is pretty gloomy and dark, but um, I do have some pretty incredible stories. And one of, one of my favorites was um, my church here. We have a sister um, organization in Kiev, an orphanage there that we support. We've been doing it for years. And so when, and, the war broke out. And even that night I mentioned where my pastor shelved his sermon and we just prayed. It was like on the 26th or 7th, like the war broke out, I think on a Tuesday and it was that following Sunday. And um, so he, my pastor Benji was immediately in touch with the orphanage. One of the bigger ones, like 200 kids. Right. And he's like, what do we do? And at that time, remember guys, we, we all thought Russia was just going to roll into Kiev, you know, like like the the um, you know the SS did into Poland. And the you know, Taliban we thought it was did just going to be over, <laughs> like not that exactly, far before. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it, who thought that the Ukrainians were going to put up resistance enough to save their capital? I mean, in Vegas, the odds would have been like a thousand to one. But anyway, they did, and. Um, so, but at the time, people were terrified. And can you imagine you're running an orphanage? It's you know all run by Christians, and they're like, "We got to get these kids the hell out of here." So, so they try to find buses. Well, as you can imagine, everybody and their mom is trying to yes. get a bus, right? Or they finally find two buses um, to get the kids out. Maybe three. I can't remember. It was like buses and then little you know minivans. So they're hightailing it. Like by the twenty. 20- fifth the night of the 25th within 24 hours they're out of there and so they 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 leave and they're they are literally going down the southern route out of Kiev because the russians are coming in from the north right 
and out of Belarus. And they know, okay, we got to kind of skirt around here, but they can see the glow of artillery fire. They can hear it. And they're telling the kids it's fireworks. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but the war is this close. And so they got this precious cargo, right? And so the first thing that happens, they're in the middle of nowhere. And, and Ukraine, it's a gorgeous country. I mean, most of it's just like sunflowers in the summertime and just a lot of agriculture. And the soil's super rich. And they're suddenly, but it's this is, of course, March. So there's it's just, you know, it's like Minnesota or whatever. And they one of the buses breaks down. And they can hear this artillery getting closer and closer. Suddenly, literally out of nowhere, a bus coming in the opposite direction. In other words, coming from the Polish border or coming from east toward the west. Excuse me, other way around, from the west toward the east, pulls up, you know, on that. The guy opens the door and he goes, what's going on? He goes, we broke down. We don't know what to do. And he goes, oh, well, I just dropped off a bunch of refugees at the border I'll take you. So they're like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's amazing. So they all pile on this bus. Off they go again. So so about an hour later, they're like, okay, the kids need, you know, they need a rest stop. They need to get something to drink, go to the bathroom. So they stop at this gas station kind of place. All the kids pile out. I mean, you know, imagine that's like herding kittens, right? 200 orphans, middle of the night, <laughs> trying to get them in to get some water and a snack. And, and so suddenly these two Ukrainian Car, uh, police cars pull out, like literally screeching into the parking lot. So the Ukraine, the Russian army is a mile out of town. You have to hightail it. It's dangerous. We will show you how to get out of here. So now they got to get all the kids back on the bus. And I mean, I mean, just to map, put yourself. In I can't. The- I, I, I can't. Like, do I we can't. have a head? How do you, how do you do a head count? You know, where's where's little Nikolai? You know, he's like three. You know, or whatever. So they think they have everybody, and but it's taking an excruciating amount of time. Suddenly, they can they hear something. They can hear ping ping against the, the back of the last bus. It's 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 small arms fire. So the cops are like, "We gotta go, go!" So they're following the cops around these roads. They see burned out. They're seeing burned out cars. They're trying to make the kids not look outside, you know, to avoid seeing dead bodies. And miraculously, they get out of there. And they reach the border. And not only that, but the cop cars escort them. If you recall, there was like 30-hour lines. And I talked to people that had to go through this. 30-hour lines at the border to get across of cars. There were so many people trying to get out. And the same if you're on foot. Like it took, like I said, it took me nine hours to cross back from Ukraine to Poland. It took me 20 minutes to cross in and then nine hours to get out. But um they they got a personal escort in in the opposite side of the highway by these by these police cars to get these kids these orphans and safely into Poland. When they got there, they're of course they're profusely thanking this bus driver, this mystery man who shows up out of nowhere, right? And they're like, "We need your name." He they're trying to give him cash. He's like, "No, no, no, I don't take any money for that. I'm not taking any money, you know." And so they take they get his name and his you know, contact and they take a photo of the name of the bus company. Cause you know, they want to follow up. So they get these kids to Germany and the leaders then are like, okay, now we can take a deep breath and we got to go, we got to thank this bus company. And, and they, they try looking for it. They, they try the numbers of the man disconnected. There's no social media, nothing online about this bus company. My pastor says, look, you know, people get cynical about what they call a miracle he goes, I call that a supernatural experience, you know? And so that was, that's, that's a really wild. cool story. And it shows you that God, God was, and I, there are several like that, that I heard. I mean, I wasn't looking for those stories. <laughs> it's like, you weren't looking by the way. Uh, Will, I had a similar experience. I had, I had asthma most of my life and I was 42 and I was in Argentina on a prayer on a, and, and somebody prayed for my asthma and I haven't I haven't used an inhaler That's since. Amazing. And so it was pretty awesome. bad before that. So it, but yeah, man, it's it got God is he's yeah. a supernatural God. We can call it whatever we want. Sure. Yeah. He loves to do that kind of stuff, you know. You know, there's a tension that comes up in that, right? Because and what yeah. is I mean, we all know the tension, right? There are certain people that weren't there, you know, the the mysterious angel bus. 
you know, I, who knows, man, maybe it was an angel. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, that's unbelievable. Um, but wha- wha- it is. And I don't have an answer to this and, I, and I'm not expecting an answer. Like, you know what I mean? But just to wrestle with it a little sure. bit with us and with me and Will and our audience, how, how is it? Like, what do you make of the fact that you have this amazing story of clearly these coincidences and all these things lining up perfectly to get these kids out in the nick of time? Right. How do you, how do, how do you line that up and wrestle with that with all the stories of atrocity that you heard? Yeah, you know, w- war is obviously a terrible thing. Um, I don't think God invites or or wants war anywhere. Um, of course, we all have free will. I mean, we know that story, and that's the way we're raised. In, you know, why does why do good things happen to bad? I mean, bad things happen to good people. Rabbi Kirshner's incredible, but you know, classic book. Um, and. Um, I, all I can say is that I think um, in any times of evil, there, there's always a remnant. And and I, I, th- I would say to your audience particularly, don't forget about uh, the, 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 just the normal people who are suffering, you know, and, and we all have, we all have our filter of our Bible and, and I have my views about Israel and, and the Jews being God's chosen people, but that does not mean that I want Palestinian kids to die, you know? And those two things are not mutually exclusive. And, and unfortunately, like you said earlier, Will, um, a lot of public discourse now is just black and white all the way up to Capitol Hill. And it's it's either, you know, it's all evil or it's all good. And and um, obviously there's there's complexities to it. Ukraine, obviously there's corruption in every government. Every government has corruption. OK, so back to your, you know, the Hunter Biden thing, even if it's all true, maybe there are secret bio labs. Does that still justify literally tens of thousands of innocent civilians dying to, to date with more to come, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, you know, but I think that, that, that it, what it says to me is that um, amidst things that God isn't rejoicing over at all, he's weeping over them and Jesus would be weeping too. There's a remnant. And, um, and I think intercessory prayer is incredibly effective and i would just encourage us all not to forget the ukrainian people and to keep praying and and the russian people and um for justice and and righteousness to prevail somehow amidst this bloody mess yeah when when was the last time you were there so originally in 07 i was there for over a month to adopt and then um and then i was there i went into western ukraine uh, just for a day when I, uh, a year ago. Okay. Got it. Cause, yeah. cause I, I, I'm curious, like, I mean, kind of to your point earlier about, you know, watching Gettysburg and thinking like saving private Ryan, I'd love to kind of get your feel based on your interactions with people of like, yeah. like, like talk about the resolve of the citizens there. Cause I mean, really, really it is like, I mean, it's, it's about as David and Goliath as you could possibly think right. you got. You know, and, and, and right. you, you really have to look at a map to appreciate, <laughs> like, the scale, scope, and size yeah. of, of who they're fighting. Um, right. And, you know, say what you will about, you know, President Zelensky. I mean, but right. he seems to be doing all the right things at least publicly, um, you know, to, to keep his people safe. And right. um, doesn't necessarily seem to be letting it go to his head again, like, publicly. I mean, who knows what's right. happening behind closed Absolutely. doors. Absolutely. Um, so, so I'd love for you just to kind of give, give our audience a feel for, for, you know, you Ukrainians, um, as a people and, yeah. and, and maybe, maybe, you know, a chance just for you to kind of gloat a little bit as a, as a dad of a Ukrainian, you know, like, yeah. do you see some of those same characteristics in your son? Yeah. You know, I mean, we all saw it right at the beginning when, um, <laughs> when that Russian warship, uh, sailed to snake island which is this tiny little rock you know and the (laughs) they were you know there's like 20 ukrainian soldiers there they're probably mostly techs they probably weren't even i don't even know if they were armed you know and they and they said you know you need to surrender from the you know they were 
whatever ship to shore radio and they said you know russia go f, f yourself <laughs> <That's so crazy. laughs> that, kind, that kind of that kind of um personifies the russian mentality it's kind of like you know what people what people don't understand too is is that um they've been a war hardened people for a decade now because the donbass war started in 14 um and they've been fighting for 10 years against russia and then against you know separatist pro-russian forces in the hansk and donetsk down in there in the donbass region and what other a lot of people don't realize too is that it was a compulsory it was either one or two year service so there are actually like three million people in Ukraine, adults that have had military who have military experience. And I think we forget that. I think if if there had been no civil ironically, if there had been no civil war, Russia probably would have just marched on. They would have goose stepped their way into the center of Maidan Plaza in Kiev. But the fact that the Ukrainians they they MacGyver, they MacGyver everything. I mean they've obviously revolutionized the use of the hundred dollar drone. I mean, it's, it will, I'm sure war colleges, you know, will, will war colleges. Yeah. Um, my uncle is a PhD in central Asian politics. He, he taught at the war college in uh, Rhode Island, but I'm sure they're, te- they're going to be teaching these tactics, you know? And um, so I think a lot of the, the whole David, the aspect of how David, how was he able to take that one rock and hit Goliath right in the center of the forehead because I, I actually think this, despite the rhetoric out of the Kremlin, that um, you know their their prerogative was obviously to take Kiev and and to affect regime change, and they failed on both levels. Uh, and then miraculously, um, they've lo- uh, the Russians have lost over fifty percent of the territory they held wow. three weeks into the war. Like right away, they they took a ton of territory. Right, they've lost. They keep, they're on their back feet. Even now, you know, I mean, they have a couple of places they're trying to advance, but that the the front line is pretty much a stalemate. Hmm. And I think, frankly, it's going to remain that until uh, hopefully the Ukraine breaks through in the south or some sort of peace can prevail, you know, but it's it. They are they are um, incredibly tough people. And the mentality is every man, woman and child like we will not ever surrender. And so that's why Zelensky comes comes with this rhetoric of we're not going to go to the peace table until, you know, they leave Crimea. And, and us in the West, we're like, well, you got to be reasonable. I mean, you got to compromise. They don't see it that way. They don't, they, they do not see it like that at wow. all, which is, which is admirable, but it's also troubling. And I'm not judging them. It's their own country's decision, but Sitting here safely in San Diego, I'm like, geez, how many generations of your young men do you have to send to the front lines? Yeah. You know, and it's uh I don't know. Thankfully, you know, Jesus Jesus has a wheel. No uh, easy answers. It's pretty grim no right easy now. Easy answers. No. You know, there's a funny no, there's meme not. just to to inject a little uh humor that when it says uh you pr- I'm yeah. sure you've seen Always it. Always good. Where someone's driving and they look over and they see one of the wheels on their car flying away and they say, not that wheel, Jesus, not that wheel. <laughs> it's a great one, dude. Cause, cause, cause here's the thing, dude, you do need to be specific as to which wheel you're asking Jesus to take. That's true. Wheel can That's mean different things. Yeah, can that, it not? And that one is like, no, and who was that? Wasn't that like, uh, Carrie <laughs> probably who knows, but. <laughs> Right after she won American Idol, uh, I think. But yeah, that one's kind of cliche. Well, the other the other bumper sticker I love is the one uh, I saw driving uh, to Utah on, on Highway 15, like through Vegas somewhere. It said, um, "Jesus loves you, but everybody else <laughs> thinks you're a." It, it wasn't it wasn't the word jackass, but it was similar. Yeah, to that. that's a good I love one. that one. And, uh, yeah, you know, but um, one of the questions, and this yeah, is kind of the anyway. last big question. And then, I mean, I don't know, last big, sure. but it's, it'll probably be the one that the next one won't take as much time. Um, but what has this war taught you in your experience in writing this book? 
how has it taught you about the human spirit, the human spirit's ability to do two things? One, to be altruistic and to care for their fellow man around them, their their countrymen. Um, and then two, um, the ability to keep going, the grit, the perseverance. What has this war taught you yeah. about the resilience, essentially, of the human spirit? Yeah. Um, there, there's a gentleman on Facebook that I'm friends with. I've never actually met him, but um, he's a pastor here and, and minister in San Diego. His name's Shannon Cap. And uh, he has an organization that just started grassroots out of just his years of relationships over in Ukraine. And, it, and the name of the organization is if you don't quit, you win. And yeah. I love that. It's very simple. Um, but that's kind of the idea here is, um, and Ukrainians have suffered. Uh, I mean, the suffering is going on over the world, all over the sure. world, obviously places like Yemen and Sudan and South Sudan and Mali. And, and so, but, but this war, it is the largest war in Europe since world war two. And it's not just a regional conflict. It's affecting um, a lot of nations, a lot of different areas of the world. And altruism, um, I mean, we have to hold on to it, you know, and, and um, it, it separates us from the worst. I mean, I mean, I think the human animal, you know, Labet Humane as, uh, uh, you know, I can't remember the author. <laughs> you guys probably remember a French author. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, you know, the human animal is the worst animal on the planet, right? I mean, we're, we're, we can do great evil. And um, that altruism is, um, we desperately need it. You know, we, we, I think, you know, uh, we need it in our country right now. We're at, we're in a really intense, um, terrifying time, in my opinion, you know, with division, um, and an inability seemingly to just cross the aisle. And I know that's what you guys are about. It's not left or right. It's looking up. And so you guys sum it up in your, in your, you know, in your whole vision and mission for why you do what you do, which I, I totally commend is you have to grab a hold of altruism. And, um, and without, uh, I think without a realization of the fact that we have very little control um, I think control is an illusion, you know, and, and the deeper we, we go into the strength is, is an enemy of the spirit. So um, do what we can do and not shrug mm, and give up. I love that. Control is an enemy of the spirit. And I totally agree with you. Our need to control leads us down to all sorts of weird and really, frankly, unhealthy yeah. and evil at times roads. You know, this uh, this need yeah. for power. I mean, yeah. what is Putin doing at his core except right. for pursuing a need to control and have power over other people? I mean, you can have all sorts of exactly. different reasons and right. contextualize the reasons, and that's all well and right. good, but it's about power. And it always has been about power, right? So right. It, it's really compelling to hear your stories, Kyle, and the way that you've – and I, I just want to thank you for going and, and, and bringing stories that – Americans um, normally don't read, right? And, 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 and an inside look into something where we have a lot of different opinions on it. It's easy for me to hear some, one of my friends right. or, or a colleague or something talk about their opinion that America shouldn't be in Ukraine or, or, or whatever. And that's fine. You can yeah. argue that. National policy, cool. But yeah, the absolutely. reality is, dude, what's happening over there is a humanitarian crisis What's going on in Gaza is is going to create and has created an enormous humanitarian crisis, regardless and independent of the desires yep. of Hamas and Israel. So exactly. what, what, what am I saying? I'm saying that I, I really my, I get grieved when I see the way in which some Christians talk about these issues. As almost as if they're not nuanced, they're then they're flipping about it, or or even worse, 
even worse, that they would feel like God was okay with all this killing. And right. because sure. they're not yeah. Christians or they're against, <laughs> right. you know, whatever, whatever. So right. the last question I have, and this yeah. is kind of just for, well, yeah. It's like the Crusades, right? Absolutely. I mean, we How can't. do we justify we can't. it? Well, yeah, we can't. I mean, we can't do it like legitimately from the Bible as New Testament believers, I don't think, but apparently they did and they found a way to do it, right? They found a way to convince a right. lot of people that it was true. Yeah. So, you know, sure. I um this last one though is really just your chance to say, what do you want our audience? And just to give you some context, our audience, it's not, it's not, it isn't a Christian podcast. Although it, it, we're both Christians, right? And we both, but but we're sure. trying. We yeah, we've sure. had many many people of different views, many many non Christians on the show, um, people that I mean, no one yeah. that I would say was like overtly hostile, but certainly not like people that were. We've had people that yeah would disagree um, very deeply with us. So I get it. We to this audience. What what do you f- want them to hear from you? Your heart, and we've we've asked. They've heard it throughout these last you know hour and four minutes. They've heard it. They they they've they've experienced that. But this isn't a response to a specific question. This is what do you want them to hear from you about this? What do you think is the most important thing you want them? Yeah. To to take away from today. Um we're all world citizens, even if we don't see ourselves that way, you know, the planet's not that big. Um, and we, I would encourage everyone to really pray the news. Um, and I would also encourage people to do the best they can to get their news from a lot of different sources. Um, and uh, whether it's left, right, center, I don't care, but just a lot of different sources and, and, but primarily, um, and thank you for that question. I'm humbled to be even sitting here with you guys and be able to answer it is that um, I think that that ultimately, a, as a Christian, I believe, you know, these battles are terrible. And what's happening in our world is, is awful. But we know how the war ends, so to speak. Um, God does have a yeah. wonderful plan for all of us. In the meantime, you know, no matter what your walk of faith is, I mean, you know, the bottom line is 92% of Americans believe right. in a God, a higher power. So wherever you are as an audience member sitting in that, um, just remember that evil, evil does not have to win mm. and it doesn't win. And um, <clears throat> so I, and, and on a broader scale, I believe though, that, that there is, there is a battle, there is a battle in the heavenly realm uh, between dark and light. Um, and that, that supersedes human beings. That's beyond human you know, I think the devil will animate and use certain people, but this isn't about Russia being the bad guy and Ukraine being the good guy. It's more about what do you, as you pray, what is the Holy Spirit leading you to pray for in that situation? Because the alignment, the alignment we see today with um, a lot of <clears throat> kind of what I would call an anti-God spirit um it's easy to pick on the, the the word Soviet, but I think that kind of personifies it. It's 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 just a perspective that that does not value life as much, I believe, as um, as a, the you know the Judeo Christian uh, uh, mindset worldview would would have us to. And so I would just encourage your listeners to thoughtfully try to listen to both sides, and if you're a praying person. Pray for peace. Pray for the peace of of Jerusalem, um, quote unquote, in that part of the world, and also uh, in other parts of the world. Um, and that's all we can do. You know, it sounds kind of kumbaya, but but it ultimately that's yeah. that's all we have. Otherwise, we're just we get we get swept away in yes. the sea of cynicism, uh, which is pretty easy to do. And we have to fight for yeah. that altruistic, you know outcropping that we it's can so hang good. on to. I, I, I read a book called um, A Praying Life. I definitely recommend it. Um, but he talked about cynicism in that mm. and the pride at the core of cynicism that you can pronounce judgment 
on all Oof. these different things because you alone have the objective view to be able to be cynical, right? Or right. to be able to pronounce a judgment on it. So that's really good. So Kyle, how can they Absolutely. keep up with your work? Where can they get the book, Hope for Ukraine? How can they keep up with your work moving forward? Sure. So um, the book's on Amazon and um, my, you know, pretty much I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man of a certain age, so I'm pretty much on Facebook. My daughters make fun of me that I'm not. Uh, I get a lot of TikTok nice. videos from them. They're all in their 20s. So I do keep up on what's funny on TikTok, um, but I'm not on IG. So mostly Facebook or through um, through my publisher, Baker Publishing Group, and you can leave a message for me through there. Um, but yeah, man, I am uh, uh, have a lot of friends on Facebook, and that's probably the easiest way personally to get in touch with me. Just drop me a DM or whatever. And uh, But th thank you both, um, mm. Will and Josh. And again, you guys are a rare air, and I Thanks. thank you for what you do. I'm really glad that you do it. I'm yeah. sure it's hard sometimes, <laughs> like any job. But um, it's not even your no. core jobs, is it? I mean, no, it costs it's a side gig for you guys. It, so we do it willingly and thankfully. Guys, so audience members, yeah, support you faithful politics. Shameless this is blood. a light yes. in the darkness. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. I can do well, it. <laughs> Kyle, thank you so much yeah. for being on. And man, I, yeah, I got to tell you, you so. I, was, I was enraptured in some of those stories. And that one about the orphans. Dude, that is a story for the ages, man. That's an amazing story. Yes. It's cool, isn't it? What? I know. No. They're like, I'm not making you this stuff up. You can't make it. You know? No one would it's, make that. Uh, so. So. Exactly. Two degrees of separation, exactly, let's say. Exactly. Yeah, through my past. Well, guys, thank you so much yeah. for joining us and, and, and listening in. And this has been thank Kyle you. Duncan. You can pick up his book, just like he said, at Amazon. It's Hope for Ukraine from Baker Publishing. Hope that you will pick up a copy and uh, get inspired by the stories that are in there. And until we see you again, it's not left, it's not right. Keep your conversations up. Thanks, guys. God bless. Amen. Um.